Okay, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Connor, um, and I'm an educator with the St. Louis Zoo. Now, today you might notice I am wearing a mask around my neck. I am in my personal living space, um, but just to prevent the spread of COVID, we are wearing these as a reminder, um, and especially if you're visiting the zoo live, that we will uh, require masks in person. Now, today I am in a bit of an odd space um, doing my webinar. I am in my natural habitat, which is the couch. <laughs> I want to uh, ask you, um, a quick question, but before I do, let's talk about animal homes. Now today I am in my home and there are a few little animal things you might find in my home. I am a zoo employee after all, so keep an eye out for any funny animal things hidden around. Now today we're going to do a little bit of, not a grand tour, but a little bit of a comparison between human and animal homes. Depending on the type of animal that you are, you might have all kinds of different things in your living space. You might not really have much of a living space at all. And this shows us three animals. Probably each of them are pretty familiar. Um, that first one is a baby deer called a fawn. The second one is uh, two beavers. One is a baby, one's a mama. And the last one is a wolf cub, so a baby cub. Now all of these animals are babies of sorts, but they have three things that are not uh, very similar. And that is the, where they live. So deer, we typically find kind of out in the open, in the woods, uh, maybe running through a field, and we don't tend to see them for very long. That's because they depend on being able to run away from danger more so than being able to hide from danger. So if you've ever heard that fight or flight response, deer are much more of the flight side. They're going to run away. They won't fly away. They'll run away as best as they can at the first sign of danger. But beavers, oh, so here we have our forest the deer live in. Beavers make their own home and they stay in it, especially in the colder months, for long periods of time. So that is where beavers go to sleep every night. That's where they store food for the winter. That's even where they raise their babies and keep them safe and protected. Now, beaver dams are really important for the ecosystem. I could talk all about them. But the important thing to know about them is it is completely built by those beavers. So that's one style of our animal home versus kind of a nomadic lifestyle of the deer that wander. They tend to sleep out in the open, in the grass, or maybe more in the bushes or woods and, and tall grasses and, and things like that, but not in any formal living space that they created themselves. And then our last example we have of the wolf is a den. So we'll, we'll have a couple different words for that um, kind of underground living lifestyle, but essentially this den is a good example of a home that this wolf may have made themselves, or they found another burrow, an animal that dug a hole, and they kind of spread it out and made it bigger so that they could fit themselves into it. So this is kind of a repurposed home, so to speak. These animals found an animal home, um, probably kicked out the current residence, and then took it over for themselves to live in. So three different styles. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, Connor, those other two animals seem to have a clear advantage. They have somewhere to sleep, somewhere that's safe, uh, where they're kind of protected. How do deer fall asleep in the woods and stay safe? Well, remember, again, they are very good at uh, running, but they're also incredible at hiding. So just to remind everybody that a deer's natural predator is something more like a wolf or a cougar, maybe a dog or a cat um, kind of focused or a uh, uh, family-oriented animal. Now keep in mind, those animals do not see the same colors as us. So while that deer that is brown, sitting in a bunch of green grass, might stand out pretty well to us, here is how a dog or a cat would see that same deer in that grass. Now, red-green colorblind means that red and green look pretty much the same. Brown is a healthy mix of both red and green. So when you put brown in front of green, they all look like the same color as each other. So believe it or not, those deer have an incredible adaptation for camouflage to keep them safe, which makes their home not so necessary. But we'll talk more about animals that actually have homes um, than the ones that don't rely on them as much. So I wanna go ahead and start us off with our first poll of the day. And this is a very open-ended webinar. I'm gonna let you do a little bit of the organizing here. So which animal room should we visit first? Now remember, these are the rooms in my home, my living space, my natural habitat, um, but we will be comparing them to animals that have similar uh, rooms in their own homes that we might not expect. So we have a kitchen, a bedroom, and a bathroom. I'll give you a few more seconds to vote on that. And we're going to get through all of these rooms today. I just want to know which one do you want us to start with? 
Okay, let's stop there. And it looks like we're pretty close, but we had a few more people vote for kitchen. So let's start there. There's our results. Okay, so let's start in the kitchen. That works great because it's right here. All right, so I'm gonna take you on the move and I'm gonna show you my natural kitchen living space. Okay. <laughs> Now, as you see behind me, there is plenty of food stored away. <clears throat> now, many animals store food for colder months. They have to get ready for times when there isn't as much food around. So if you're a beaver and you eat mostly plant life, well, winter's gonna be a tough time for you because there's not a lot of plants that are alive and available. So they have to store all of the, the softer sticks and bark to eat um, in their home. Another great example um, is a species that we have at the zoo called the black-tailed prairie dog. And I'll go ahead and show you a picture of them now. Now, in my opinion, these are some of the cutest animals we have in the entire zoo. We just had a bunch of babies I was fortunate enough to see um, come out for summer and spring. Um, so they are doing fine <laughs> at the zoo. Now, these prairie dogs are incredible animals. They're very, very um, well organized. So what they do is they live in underground tunnels. Now, here's another close relative of the prairie dog. This is another rodent. Now, prairie dogs are not dogs like we might think. They're actually a rodent. This is another rodent, but not everybody might recognize it. So I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. If you want to type in the chat, what animal is this? It's kind of scary looking. It uh, doesn't look very hairy. I don't really see a whole lot of eyes on it. Is it a worm? Do we think it's a worm with legs? Could be. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and check my chat box. Here we go. Oh, I see a mole, mole, mole rat. Great job, everybody. That was a pretty easy one for you. Okay, you got it. So that is our naked mole rat. And naked mole rats are rodents, just like prairie dogs. And they also have very similar lifestyles. So they have underground tunnels, they will live in, they'll store food in there for the colder months, um, and they actually have a very special uh, lifestyle. Now we have naked mole rats at the zoo as well. In the wild, we tend to see kind of larger colonies that prioritize a female matriarch. And this is a big word, basically means the queen. She is the female boss of everybody, and everybody um, takes a lot of their time to bring her food, make sure she's taken care of, and of course, raise the young that she gives birth to and things like that. So it's a big community that works together um, to take care of one big female who's in charge. Now, this might sound like a familiar concept to you, but in mammals, it's actually pretty uncommon. However, in bugs and in invertebrates, it's very common. Animals like Ants and bees have a queen matriarch that lays all of the eggs, takes care of the colony, and supports that uh, constant reproduction so that they can get their job done. Now, what's cool about all three of these animals is they all store food um, in their home. So naked mole rats will have a special tunnel designated for food storage, and nothing gross will ever get in there. They keep it very clean. But this leaf cutter ant over here also has a food storage mechanism. It's very special. It's kind of similar to my fridge behind me. It grows mold very well. <laughs> now I have to clean my fridge out, but these leaf cutter ants are growing their mold on purpose. They actually feed off of fungus, which is mold. Um, and they are bringing those leaves into their nest to feed the fungus. So these ants are actually farmers. They're growing a fungus for them to eat and feeding the fungus so they have more fungus to eat kind of like um, feeding our cows or watering our plants or things like that. It's essentially a little livestock that these ants are taking care of underground. Very cool project. And just like us, they will store all kinds of food in that special fungus room. Now, bees are probably more familiar with food storage. Uh, if you've ever eaten honey, you know that honey bees make honey and it is delicious and they line their entire living space with it. So the wax that makes up their hive is actually produced by their body. It comes out of their, their skin and their, their body, and they kind of mush it up into those little honeycomb hexagon shapes that we're so familiar with. Now that honey is stored there to take care of other bees when they're hungry, uh, when there's not as many flowers around, and also to take care of their young. So the larva of the bees, the baby bees, <laughs> have to live in that honey to survive and get big enough to become full-grown bees. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that does it for our kitchen. Let's go ahead and move on to our next room. 
Let me just check our chat really quick. Yes, they eat the fungi. I love it. The fungus, yes. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Okay, great. So let's move on to our next animal room, which is everybody's favorite, I'm sure. This is the bathroom. Oh, no, don't worry. It's not, we're not going to be in here very long. <laughs> now, bathrooms are a familiar concept to people. We have very formal areas we go and do our business in. Now, this isn't always true with animals. Some animals, like birds and fish, they don't really have the ability to control when they go to the bathroom. So they don't usually stay organized <laughs> like our prairie dogs might with their food. But there are plenty of animals that are very diligent and very careful about where they choose to make their bathroom. <laughs> so today, our species of note is the slender-tailed meerkat. This is a meerkat species we have at our children's zoo, and they are very, very well known for being similar to prairie dogs. They live underground in tunnels. They have big communities where they live together, they take care of each other, and they often stand on their hind legs like that, with their little paws hanging down um, as a lookout. So they're watching out for danger. Now, an important thing to know about meerkats is that they live in that big community, sure, but they always work together to protect their colony, their big group. Now, if another big group of meerkats were to get too close, they might set up their homes right next to each other. And if those meerkats got along and things were okay, that might be all right, but there wouldn't be enough food in their surrounding area to support both of those colonies. So an important thing meerkats do, they actually choose where they go to the bathroom depending on where they want their territory. So they will go a certain distance from their main entrance to their underground tunnel. They'll go to the bathroom outside of their tunnel and they will make sure that other meerkats can smell their bathroom <laughs> so that they know to stay away, that this is already inhabited land and it is not yours to move in on. So it's an important thing for these meerkats survival to know to go to the bathroom in other places to tell other meerkats not to come by. Now, another thing to note is that meerkats, just like prairie dogs, can store food underground, just like naked mole rats, um, and they can have designated rooms for storing food, for raising young, and things like that. Meerkats also can have a designated bathroom as well. So they'll have a special tunnel that they'll do their business in. All of the meerkats in the colony will start going there because they can smell it, and they know that's where the smelly stuff goes, they might just let that tunnel cave in and close. And it's kind of like having your own little outhouse that buries itself. It's kind of neat. <laughs> our next species I want to talk about is the black rhino. So here's Katie Rain, our big female at the St. Louis Zoo. We have three black rhinos. We're so fortunate to have them. Um, they're doing very, very well right now. Now, Katie Rain here is a female, but male rhinos have a big reputation for being especially territorial. So if you thought the meerkats were bad, not wanting to sh share their space, male rhinos can be a lot more territorial. <clears throat> so remember that rhinos don't see very well. They rely on their sense of smell and hearing to figure out what's around them, if they're in danger, if there are any threats or things like that. So when a black rhino male smells another black rhino male, it can be a big problem. They don't like to share the same space. They're very competitive for land and for females and things like that. So what rhinos do to avoid so much interaction, potential fighting and things like that, is they will actually head to the edges of their territory and they will use that as their bathroom. And that works just like a fence or a wall or a sign. It's just a big pile of dung instead. <laughs> now, if you don't have thumbs and you don't speak English, it's hard to write, hey, this is my home, stay out. So they use a different method that works even better, in my opinion, because if you smell that rhino dung, it's going to make a bigger impact than a sign that says, hey, stay away. <laughs> so they're pretty effective. They're pretty good at keeping their territory marked. <laughs> so let's see. You said, oh, they're so cute. Oh, good. All right. Now let's move on to our next, our last animal room today. Now, remember, if you have any questions during the program, feel free to put them in the Q&A section and I will get to as many of those as I can. Now we are back in a more familiar territory. You can see my zoo poster back here. We have my lovely bear blanket and fish sheets because again, who I am as a person, I am a zoo employee. Um, this is what I do. 
Now, this is a typical bedroom that you'd see for a human. We have a bed, we have pillows, we have very soft things for us to sleep in at night because we like to be comfortable. Now, this is actually a pretty common thing in the animal world as well. So uh, uh, the first thing that probably comes to your mind when you think of animals that have bedrooms is a bird. Birds make nests. Almost every bird species will do that to raise their young. Um, they make some kind of soft material for their young to stay in, to keep them clean, keep them safe, mostly. Now, this is my favorite bird nest of all time. This is the, bird, uh, the nest of a weaver bird. Now, these are incredible animal builders. They take little sticks, they weave them together, just like you might to make a basket or something like that. If you were braiding your hair, they will take those little sticks and intertwine them until they have a full nest. Now, we're not talking just a bird nest that holds the eggs. This has a roof. It has an overhang. Is that an awning? It might even have an adjustable sunroof for all I know. It is complex. It's very, very elaborate, and it takes a long time to build it. But these birds are incredibly talented, and this keeps their babies safe from all kinds of animals. You see this nest is built at the very edge of a tree branch, and that's because there are all kinds of animals that would love to climb up that tree and get to the eggs or the baby birds. So having that nest fully encompass those eggs increases their chance of being safe. It's a very special adaptation. Now at the St. Louis Zoo, we do have the white-headed buffalo weaver. That's the bird you're seeing on my slide there. They are beautiful African birds. And if you get a chance to go to the birdhouse and see them, I highly recommend it. They're fascinating, very, very um, intelligent birds. Now, some animals don't have the ability to build a nest, and they might not really need to. This is one of our Aldabra tortoises, and this is our head veterinarian, Dr. Luis Padilla, helping out on a checkup. Now, these are, this is an incredible sight. I love our vet. He's doing an awesome job, and I love these turtles, too, these tortoises. They're just so incredible. They're massive, and they're very lucky. They don't have a lot of predators on their island. So that's actually why they've been able to grow so big and move so slow, because they never really had to run from much on those tiny little isolated islands off of Africa. So remember, that's an Aldabra tortoise, not the Galapagos you might think of. <clears throat> now these turtles, tortoises, have their homes with them on their back at all times. When they are scared, if they did need to protect themselves, they would hide in their shell, they'd pull their head in, and they might fold their arms in front of their head to keep them safe and there is hardly anything that'd be able to get in there. So they're pretty safe. They can take their home with them. But that's not to say that these animals don't want to be comfortable. So even though this turtle might not build a bed, they still need the right temperatures and kind of uh, environment to live in to be happy. Now here's a great example of an animal that has a bedroom built into their body. This is by far one of the coolest little bedroom adaptations you will ever hear of. It's a marsupial. You've probably heard of marsupials before. We have one in North America, which is the possum, but there are multiple species of possum found around the world. And then there are things like wombats and Tasmanian devils, and of course, our red kangaroo. Now, all of the animals I just listed have a pouch for holding their babies. And this is a really special adaptation because they have their babies when they're still super teeny tiny. A baby kangaroo, when it's born, is only about as big as the tip of my thumb. So when they're born and they sit in their mother's pouch for months, at the zoo, sometimes we don't even know that they're in there until they finally poke out their little head after months of finally growing from this big to as big as you see those two little joeys in the pouch there. Now, this is a very lucky sight. We have a mother that had two kangaroo joeys, so very special, and they are even able to share the pouch together because of how special that pouch is and how much it's able to stretch. Very cool. Now I'm gonna show you a quick picture and I want you to tell me in the chat, what do you think is going on in that picture? We see some blankets, some leaves. What do you think is happening there? And I'll go ahead and check my chat while I'm able to. Okay. <laughs> Okay, nap time. That's a great answer. Absolutely. So in this picture, we see a big mass of red fur and some blankets. Is this something weird going on at the zoo? It's not. Our orangutans get enrichment every day, just like all of our animals do. But their enrichment involves a lot of bedding. 
One of the most important skills that orangutans learn at a young age is how to make their own bed. So just like our moms probably taught us how to make our bed, I wish my mom could see that. I'm so proud of it. <laughs> Even orangutan moms teach their babies how to make their bed. Now orangutans make a new bed every night to be comfortable and um, safe and protected when they go to sleep. And this is very, very important for their lifestyle because just like us, they're very intelligent animals. And that means they have a lot of things going on in their brain. It needs a lot of rest and relaxation time. So we call that REM sleep, that cycle of sleep where your brain's healing and fixing and kind of repairing itself. Now, the more sleep you get, the more REM sleep you can possibly get. So the more comfortable these animals are when they go to sleep, the more likely they are to sleep through the night and continue to have increased brain function. Very cool to see a direct correlation between sleeping comfort and intelligence. It's fascinating to me. Now, this is a picture of Mira when she was much younger. This is kind of an older picture. Mira just turned 50. She's an amazing orangutan. She's mom to two of the orangutans we have at the zoo today. Um, and she is, of course, no exception to the rule of orangutans needing a nice, comfy living space at night to go to sleep in, just like us. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to share our last poll, which is just a quick little question for you. Um, well, our second to last poll. <clears throat> Now of the animals we saw, or the, the animal homes we saw, which one would suit you the best? So if you were going to sleep at night, would you prefer to sleep out in the open, maybe like a deer, out under the stars and the grass and the field? Maybe you'd like a big nest, like a bird nest, or even an orangutan nest with nice blankets and things uh, jumbled up together. Or maybe you'd love to sleep in a burrow. I have a friend who said if he could live in a cave, he would love to do it. It'd be a really cool lifestyle. I don't know how ready I am to be a caveman, but maybe some of you are. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a few more seconds to fill that out. Oh, and I see our chat. Orangutan is sleeping. Nap time. Yes. Okay, so we said most of us would prefer to sleep in a nest. I think that makes the most sense. Our bedroom, it kind of is a nest um, in terms of the animal homes that we were talking about. So if you like the way you're sleeping now, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, now let me go ahead and look over our Q&A section. Remember, if you have any more questions, feel free to uh, submit them now, and I'll try to get to as many as I can. So it says, who likes naked mole rats? I like naked mole rats. I think they're really cool. Um, a fun fact about them is they can't see hardly at all. Their eyes are almost covered in skin and they don't really need to see. So when they go underground, um, there's no light to be able to, to uh, look where they're going or anything like that. Padmini says, is there a king in the animal colonies? That's a great question. Now in the colonies we discussed that have a matriarch, the males are typically um, all the same. There's not one that stands out like there is with the queen matriarch where one will be kind of on top and the rest um, will be workers. But there are plenty of examples of uh, male uh, patriarchs is what you'd call it, the male, um, kind of being in charge. And that's more common in animals like mammals. You'll see a, a male lion with his big mane, um, the big roar and slightly larger than the females to kind of work as the, the leader of the group and things like that. Uh, but there's exceptions to that as well. A lot of people hear the alpha wolf um, and they think that boss wolf is always the, the biggest male. It's actually more often the female. Um, so just depends. Do your research and, and learn more about the, the male and female roles within animals. There's some really fascinating stuff there. Plenty of exceptions to make you think. <laughs> okay, so I see, what is your favorite animal home? That's a great question. If I had to say off the top of my head, it'd either be our weaver bird nest or it would be a parrotfish slime bubble. Parrotfish, when they go to sleep at night, they actually produce mucus on their scales, just like all fish do. They're kind of slimy to the touch. And that mucus extends out from their body and it makes a bubble underwater around them. So it's full of water, but it's a slime bubble and it completely seals in their smell. So this is really special when you're a parrotfish trying to rest on the coral reef in almost complete darkness and there are sharks coming around and the sharks can sense the electrical signals from your muscles moving. They can smell every part of your body. When you have a literal bubble to block your smells, 
um, and, and anything from feeling you, it works like incredibly uh, effective adaptation. It's one of the coolest ones out there. So long answer, but yes, I, I think I'm gonna go with my parrot fish bubble. I think that's my favorite animal home. And they are kind of nomadic, they're fish. They don't have a, a burrow. Um, they, they travel, but they make this bubble themselves every night, kind of like having your own tent to pitch. <laughs> I guess that's a, one analogy you could use. <clears throat> Okay, let's take one more question, which is what is your favorite animal sound or call? Um, now, I think I'd have to say uh, Kingfisher is my favorite animal call. And that's because I love to fish. So when I hear a Kingfisher, that means there are minnows to be hunting. Kingfisher are a type of bird um, that will actually kind of dive into the water and grab minnows. They're very beautiful. They're very acrobatic and, and uh, controlled flyers. Uh, I think they were actually inspiration for uh, bullet trains. Their head is very aerodynamic. So the bullet train was designed to work just like a kingfisher head. Anyways, the noise of a kingfisher call makes me incredibly happy because I know there are fish to be caught. And there's also a beautiful ecosystem supporting animals like kingfishers. So when I find a spot that has kingfishers, I know I'm in a good spot. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all for your questions and for joining me today. I had an awesome time showing you my natural habitat and comparing it to some of the animals out there. Now, as a reminder, our zoo is open today. Um, well, now in general, um, but we do require you to wear cloth masks and to make a free timed reservation ahead of time. That way we can keep a control of how many people are in the zoo and keep everybody as safe as possible. Thank you again for tuning in. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Bye-bye.